everyone. My name is Shelby Asesco, and I'm a registered dietitian at Cook Hospital of USC, and I specialize in abdominal transplant and hepatobiliary surgery. I'm very excited to be with you at the 2021 SCSG GI Symposium Nursing Course. Today, we're going to discuss GI diseases and nutrition. I'm going to kind of do an overview of a couple different topic areas that I felt like were applicable to you. First off, we're going to discuss malnutrition, what malnutrition is, how it affects patient care and outcomes, as well as how to recognize and diagnose malnutrition. We'll review basics of nutrition support, nutrition for pancreatitis, liver disease nutrition, as well as ileostomy diet and troubleshooting. So hopefully one of these areas is applicable to your practice. So malnutrition, we know that malnutrition is highly prevalent in hospitalized patients with an estimated 2.2 million patients uh, being diagnosed with malnutrition in their stay. It's associated with numerous complications, two times a longer hospital stay, threefold higher mortality rates, double hospital costs, 1.6 times higher 30-day readmission rates. Additionally, malnutrition is associated with other clinical outcomes such as impaired wound healing, infection risk, and immunosuppressed state. All things we don't want in our patient care. So how do we diagnose malnutrition? I think this is a really important topic that oftentimes um, there's a lot of debate over, but we know back in 2012, White et al. came out with essentially the Aspen and malnutrition um, diagnostic criteria. And this is really, this chart is specifically showing the etiology. So we know that there's different etiologies of how malnutrition happens. And we put them into buckets of starvation related, chronic disease related, or acute disease related. So this is just kind of an overview of what those etiologies look like. Well, then once we figure out the etiology, how do we really identify, document, and diagnose malnutrition? So this is a part of that recognized 2012 malnutrition diagnostic criteria that hopefully you're using in your hospital system or clinic system is using as well. But it's six, um, six set of standard diagnostic criteria, including energy intake, percentage of weight loss compared to usual body weight, a physical exam, including body fat, muscle mass, fluid accumulation, hand grip strength. Of note, the fluid accumulation must be nutritionally related and cannot be related to a clinical condition such as, for example, um, liver disease or renal disease. And hand grip strength can be tested with objective measures to measure functional status. The physical exam, including body mass and muscle mass, has a number of different sites that are used in practice. This physical exam is known as the Nutrition Focused Physical Exam, or NFPE. So what about albumin and pre-albumin? So both critical illness and chronic illness are characterized by inflammation. In such, hepatic reprioritization occurs, resulting in lower serum concentrations of both albumin and pre-albumin. Also, the redistribution of these serum proteins occurs because of an increase in capillary permeability. We know there is an association between inflammation and malnutrition, but not between malnutrition and these visceral protein levels. So these albumin and pre-albumin levels should not be used or they do not accurate, accurately represent nutritional status in patients. These levels correlate with patients at risk for adverse outcomes such as mortality rather than malnutrition in the degree of malnutrition. So we know that it's very, very important to preserve the GI flora or the enteral flora. We know that enteral nutrition or EN um, or oral diet can preserve gut mucosal barrier function, helping to prevent bacterial translocation. So oftentimes when we're leaving patients MPO, this actually has been shown to increase risk of infection because recent studies do show long-term fasting or continuous periods of MPO status does alter gut flora, resulting in the growth of numerous bugs we know that parenteral nutrition, which we'll discuss today, is recommended only when patients have failed their trial of enteral nutrition to help kind of prevent this bacterial translocation and improve um, the GI flora and tract. 
So if the gut works, use it, kind of an easy rule of thumb. We know that enteral nutrition or tube feeding um, supports both structure and function of the gut. It modulates the stress and systemic immune response and attenuates disease severity. So this chart is a nice way to kind of break down between structure and function of the GI tract. We know that enteral nutrition supports structure in a number of different ways. These are some of the highlighted areas, such as maintaining the villus height, as well as supporting massive um, secretory IgA producing immunocytes that compose the gut associated lymphoid tissue or GULT. From a function perspective, we know that enteral nutrition supports tight junctions between the intraepithelial cells, which in turn prevents bacterial translocation, stimulates blood flow, and releases trophic endogenous agents. So critical care nutrition assessment, this is just kind of a nice cheat sheet for you that goes over really what our nutrition needs are from a critical care perspective from both an energy and a protein standpoint. This is a recommendation from the 2016 critical care Aspen guidelines that kind of gives a nice, um, in a sense, overview based on BMI and what that looks like based on if we're using actual body weight or ideal body weight and what those recommended weight ranges are based on those kilograms of body weight. So the critical care bundle statement, this is just a nice snippet as a reminder of this bundle statement that I hope many of you are using if you're working in the critical care space. So we all wanna make sure we're assessing patients' nutritional status on admission to the ICU, and we're determining goals of their nutrition therapy. Really best practice is initiating early enteral nutrition within 24 to 48 hours. So that's really the recommended window. Following the onset of critical illness and admission to ICU, with an increase to our nutrition goals and therapy over the first week of stay. We wanna of course take steps as needed to reduce risk of aspiration and improve tolerance to gastric feeding. Of course, using um, enteral feeding protocols based on your institution, not using gastric residual volumes routinely in the ICU to monitor enteral nutrition, and we'll talk about that, as well as starting parenteral nutrition when enteral nutrition is not feasible or the patient is highly at risk of malnutrition or is malnourished on admission to ICU. So enteral nutrition indications and contraindications. We know enteral nutrition is indicated whenever our oral intake is insufficient to meet our needs for prolonged period. Contraindicated with a number of different conditions or states, including bowel obstructions, paralytic ileus, severe malabsorption states, high output ECFs, or patients who are hemodynamically unstable or have um, high dose vasopressors that are needing increase in titration. The literature does support that enteral nutrition can be safely delivered on vasopressor support when it's adequately and appropriately monitored in choosing gastric access over post pyloric. So gastric residual volumes, this has gained a lot of traction and wind over the past, I'd say five to seven years. So gastric residual volumes should not, again, be used as part of routine monitoring in the ICU setting, as there has been data not correlating to pneumonia, regurgitation, and aspiration. However, routinely monitoring gastric residual volume can lead to increased incidence of clogging, cessation of enteral nutrition or holding of our therapy, um, nursing time, and lead to reduced volume that's delivered, as well as promote patients in an inadequate um, nutritional state. Instead, we want to make sure we're doing daily physical examinations, looking at abdominal distension, um, if emesis or nausea is present, looking at radiological films, KUBs, and evaluating for risk of aspiration and looking at our tube tip placement. Parenteral nutrition support. So, of course, we need to use parenteral nutrition um, in some patients. In some patients, it's the life-saving therapy. So we want to use it, of course, when patients are unable to receive nutrition through their GI tract or it's not feasible to gain access or we're unable to feed or use their tract. Um, essentially, there's two forms, as you know, total parenteral nutrition requiring central access and peripheral parenteral nutrition. Um, this encompasses midlines. You can't run TPN through a midline. That's something we often have to continue education with. So GI motility. So I think this is an interesting one too, as far as the surgical world goes. So we know that literature supports that bowel sounds and evidence of bowel function 
For example, passing um, gas or stool is not required for the initiation of enteral nutrition. GI dysfunction, specifically in the ICU setting, we know occurs in up to 70% of patients depending on their state. So many of these patients have altered GI function. And so therefore relying on bowel sounds or bowel function is not the most appropriate method for looking at if we can start enteral nutrition in patients. We know bowel sounds are indicative of contractility and not necessarily relate to mucosal integrity, barrier function, or absorptive capacity. Ileus can actually be propagated by these repeated and prolonged periods of being kept NPO. We know that remaining NPO after midnight for diagnostic tests is not always warranted. Um, in many procedures, you don't need to be NPO for you know, 12, 14 hours prior, and it may only be four to six. Um, but we know that these repeated NPO times for procedures affects 25 to 33% of patients and it accounts for about a quarter of the time of not getting adequate nutrition. Feeding in the 24 hours after surgery actually can help reduce postoperative ileus, which I'll show you some of the literature and data on that, attenuate desmotility, and prevent bowel wall edema. So feeding early which is kind of our next um, topic here. So let's review what some of the literature shows about feeding after um, gastrointestinal surgeries and other various surgeries. So we know that feeding a patient early after a bowel resection allows for both stronger anastomosis and actually can help reduce postoperative ileus, which I'll review some meta-analysis with you today. Major surgeries in, of course, the abdomen and pelvis are more likely to cause postoperative ileus but feeding early within that 24 hour period can actually help reduce postoperative ileus, which you'll see in many of these enhanced recovery after surgery or ERAS pathways coming out in many, many different um, surgical service lines, attenuate dysmotility and prevent bowel wall edema. So here's a nice meta-analysis completed on uh, 15 studies involving about 1200 patients. We knew, um, which showed that feeding at, within 24 hours of GI surgery strengthen anastomosis with greater collagen and fibrin deposition and fibroblast infiltration with a significant reduction, 45% in post-op complications. And there was no worsening effect on the anastomotic dehiscence. Here again, um, so we know that oral intake, including clear liquid should really be initiated within hours after surgery. In most patients, and regular food is often well tolerated within 24 hours after the operation. Here's a couple other studies to help kind of prove my point here. So early feeding is, shows a reduction in mortality and complications. So a couple studies by Lewis et al. and Oslin et al. looking at a lot of different randomized control trials, 13 and 15, undergoing different um, GI surgeries and resectional surgeries. And we see that these patients had a reduction in mortality rate. Another meta-analysis of 15 studies analyzed a total of about 1,352 patients, which showed that early feeding was tolerated without nausea or vomiting, decreased length of stay, and decreased length of postoperative ileus in these patients who were fed early. Here's a fun fact. There's no evidence really supporting that clear liquid diets is better tolerated as the initial diet choice, and that a significant disadvantage actually of clear liquid diet is that it puts patient at potentially an increased risk of aspiration because of oral dispersion and poor bolus formation that's required when you are on a thin liquid clay liquid diet. So nutrition support transitions. So how do we really go about prescribing and transitioning patients between nutrition support modalities? So we know a feeding plan must be established and adequate prior to disconnecting whatever current method of nutrition support you're using. So for example, the patient's on total parenteral nutrition and then started on a clear liquid diet, we should wait until the diet gets advanced and tolerated prior to weaning and stopping the total parenteral nutrition. Another example, patient is on total parenteral nutrition and started on trickle feedings. We should wait until the trickle feedings are established and tolerated and started to being titrated before we just discontinue the total parenteral nutrition. Reminder that clear liquid diets is generally speaking around 200 to 300 calories per day with less than 10 grams of protein. 
And this does not meet the needs of any nutrition, um, the nutrition needs of any patient, more than likely. 60% of nutrition needs should be met by the new feeding modality prior to stopping. So there is an art to weaning and transitioning patients. It's important not to discontinue because when we discontinue too early, we're not necessarily bridging the gap, but we're creating a gap or an energy and protein deficit that didn't necessarily need to be there. So really what some suggestions and what we can do to troubleshoot is we can just decrease the volume of the total parental nutrition rather than just deceasing it entirely or change two feedings to nocturnal or cyclic. So we're not running them 24 hours a day, which can also help stimulate appetite if you're transitioning to a diet. So increasing enteral nutrition decreases pneumonia rates. This is something um, we hear a lot in practice and we think sometimes that Oh, if we increase the two feeds, this could put them at a higher risk of aspiration pneumonia, but actually the data doesn't necessarily support that. And we know that from a couple of these studies here that we see an increased volume or an increased infusion rate of enteral nutrition actually led to a decreased um, pneumonia rate. You can see one of the studies there compared um, parental nutrition versus enteral nutrition and looking at pneumonia rates with increased volumes of enteral nutrition. We do know, however, that Pneumonia and bacterial colonization of the upper respiratory tree is more closely associated with aspiration of contaminated oral pharyngeal secretions rather than regurgitation and aspiration of contaminated gastric contents. So essentially, spit tends to be another reason in our own saliva, is a risk for and can cause and lead to aspiration rather than contaminated gastric contents. So moving into pancreatitis. Um, so this is a really nice kind of overview of evidence-based guidelines for management of acute pancreatitis from a nutrition standpoint. So we know that enteral tube feeding should be primary therapy in patients with predicted severe acute pancreatitis. The data is very strong in this area. Um, there's more and more coming out. This is from 2012, and I can tell you there's a lot of other stuff that's come out since then. Um, but we know enteral nutrition is very protective in these patients, um, these severe acute pain patients. We know that from a formula choice, we don't necessarily need a fully elemental formula. And many of these patients tolerate a polymeric or even a semi-elemental formula. In practice, I typically will always use a kind of a semi-elemental formula with our acute pain patients and have pretty good success with it. Enteral nutrition and acute pain can be administered the either the nasojejunal or nasogastric does not necessarily need to have a nasojejunal. We know that these patients can be fed via the gastric route and tolerate um, tube feeding. Parental nutrition should only be used as second line therapy if all other modalities are not working, the patient's not tolerating. So there's a couple check boxes to check prior to starting parental nutrition on a patient with pancreatitis. Looking at this interna international consensus guideline for nutrition therapy and pancreatitis. So we know for mild and moderate diseases, these patients can likely tolerate diet advancement within three to four days. Um, these patients are often very good at advancing their own diet and seeing what they can and can't tolerate with appropriate education of um, potentially a fat restriction. Nutrition therapy is generally not needed for mild to moderate cases. Um, it should be considered, though, if the disease severity is anticipated duration, if the patient's going to be NPO for greater than a week, it should be considered. But there's a lot of diet manipulation and advancement that can likely be done with these patients with good success. For severe acute pancreatitis patients, though, early enteral nutrition is really best practice. So getting those patients on EN within 24 to 48 hours is really best practice in these patients with a grade A level of evidence. And of course, as we talked about, EN is preferred over PN. So let's move into a little bit of liver nutrition discussion. So I like to discuss this as kind of being three buckets of things we must consider when we're looking at um, patients with cirrhosis. So malnutrition, we've talked about a bit, really it's this inadequate nutritional state, which is often multifactorial, whether it be patient has poor appetite or they're consistently NPO throughout their admission or they're encephalopathic and they're not safe to swallow, et cetera. 
Um, but let's talk about sarcopenia and frailty a bit. So sarcopenia affects up to 70% of patients with advanced liver disease. Again, 70% of patients with advanced liver disease. There's growing evidence indicating that sarcopenia correlates with patient survival undergoing um, liver transplant eval. There are diagnostic cut points that are specific to patients with cirrhosis. Looking at these um, CT imaging, there's, you can obtain a single slice at um, the lumbar three region. Some studies do look at the lumbar four, but the lumbar three seems to be the one that most studies are looking at for this tool. And so there are male and female um, cut points looking at patients with cirrhosis that's developed by Dr. Jennifer Lai to evaluate if a patient with cirrhosis is indeed sarcopenic. Primary sarcopenia is age-related versus secondary is chronic disease-related. And really it's, um, the definition is the loss of skeletal muscle mass and function. Looking at frailty, we know this is really physical weakness. Um, so I encourage many of you, if you're not looking at these things, if you're working with advanced liver disease or patients with cirrhosis, these are really things we must consider um, when we're making assessments in these patients. Frailty characteristics include weight loss, exhaustion, reduced physical activity, slowness, and weakness. Do any of you know um, a, a frailty tool and how to look at frailty in a patient? So UCSF developed the LFI or the Liver Frailty Index tool. You can Google this. Um, there's a calculator online you can use. I took a snapshot of it right here. So really you're filling out these different boxes to calculate the LFI score. This tool was developed by UCSF to measure frailty and quantify and trend it in people with cirrhosis. It encompasses the aspects of frailty, including physical function and capacity, mobility and weakness. So malnutrition and liver disease. We know many of these patients have increased nutritional needs due to a number of different things, such as the metabolic effect of ascites, protein losses, inflammation, um, infection. So we really have to make sure these patients are getting adequate nutrition um, during their disease course. Inadequate oral intake, many of these patients are nauseous, um, they have loss of appetite or anorexia, they may struggle with delayed gastric emptying, abdominal pain and distension, altered GI motility, as well as dysbiosis, um, altered taste changes or dysbiosia, and early satiety. Many of the patients I work with just don't really feel hungry ever, and they feel full very quickly. These patients have metabolic alterations, including the inhibition of muscle growth, they're on corticosteroids, with, which can alter their metabolic um, profile as well. Altered macronutrient uh, breakdown, altered glucose, lipid, protein metabolism, decreased glycogen levels, reduced storage capacity of many nutrients. And we'll talk about micronutrients in a minute. These patients are high risk or they already have a degree of malabsorption and maldigestion with reduced bile flow, microbiome changes, SIBO, alcohol, history or use, as well as potentially pancreatic insufficiency. So these are all things leading to and why these patients have such a high risk of malnutrition and why so many of the patients we see with liver disease are malnourished. So how do we troubleshoot poor oral intake? And this um, slide I think does not apply just to liver patients, but this applies to any patient in a sense. So we're going to really look at their diet restrictions and see what we can do to liberalize them. Um, do we need a two gram restriction or are we able to potentially alter that a little bit? If you have a patient who's only eating two very small meals a day and they're on a 2000 milligram sodium restriction, they're not getting 2000 milligrams because they're not eating all of their food. Um, so potentially seeing what we can do to liberalize their diet a bit to help improve their oral intake which allows for more palatable food options. Looking at oral nutrition supplements or nutritional shakes can be extremely helpful in these patients to help give them extra calories and protein. Minimizing the MPO time, small frequent meals and snacks, as well as a bedtime snack is important. Looking at appetite stimulants, if we need to start them on one, as well as supplemental tube feeds. So we might need to have nocturnal feedings in these patients 
because in the daytime, they're just not progressing as we anticipate. Micronutrient alterations in end-stage liver disease. So many of these patients, we're seeing more and more and more, and we're seeing literature supporting that. Many of these patients are, of course, not eating enough, but then they also have micronutrient alterations. Um, we see as just from lack of nutritional intake from their diet, high losses from various things such as diuretic use, dialysis, continuous renal replacement therapy if they're in an inpatient setting, their social history, um, alcohol history puts them, predisposes them to thiamine deficiency, folic acid, pyridoxine, B12, zinc, or selenium deficiency, as well as cholestatic liver has an increased risk of fat soluble vitamin deficiency from fat malabsorption. Um, we know this is secondary to decreased bile acid production and reduce synthesis of carrier and transport proteins in the liver. So diet for these end stage um, cirrhotic patients or prior to transplant, this is what we use at um, Keck Hospital of USC, really a high energy, high protein diet in small frequent bouts, limiting salt overall. So we just say, try to take the salt shaker away, um, looking at their liberalization for restriction, avoid fasting for greater than three to six hours, depending on the patient and consuming a late evening snack with a 50 gram complex carb to help top them over to the morning, using oral nutritional supplements, regular physical activity, eating foods that are full of both prebiotic and probiotic, as well as trying to get in some fiber. So avoiding foods, of course, that we know are bad for the liver. So foods high in trans fat, high fructose corn syrup, saturated fat, or high amounts of omega-6 fats. Um, we try to counsel them on minimizing these foods that are not necessarily beneficial to a liver that is failing. So looking at these guidelines, um, th these are a nice snapshot. These came out in 2019 from EASL, uh, Clinical Practice Guidelines on Chronic Liver Disease, and these are pre-op for liver transplant. So of course we wanna screen for both actually malnutrition and I love it, it's a sarcopenia. And these patients um, listed for transplant are scheduled for any kind of elective surgery and treating the malnutrition and sarcopenia prior to elective surgery to help improve clinical outcomes. We're screening for that sarcopenic obesity using body comp analysis when able. Um, Preoperatively, treatment goals should be individualized for the maintenance of nutritional status with a plan of an energy intake goal and a protein intake goal. Generally speaking, between 30 and 35, depending on the plan is maintenance or improvement with protein intake of 1.2 to 1.5, depending on the goal, again, maintenance or improvement of nutritional status. Moving into ostomy nutrition. So we know that normal ostomy output is expected looking at the following. We're gonna focus on ileostomy. Uh, we know that on average about 1200 ml is generally typical for a newer ostomy in an inpatient setting when it matures, about 600 to 800 ml. Judging ostomy up to six liters in colostomy 200 to 600 ml, depending on the patient. Patients need to know this. This is so important if they don't understand what their ostomy is supposed to produce and how diet can affect that. So looking at diet for high output ileostomy patients, so we can troubleshoot a couple different things, looking at carbohydrates, salt, and fluids. So from a carbohydrate perspective, looking at generous, complex carbohydrate intakes, such as pastas, rice, potatoes, and breads for patients who are having high output ileostomy, avoiding simple sugars in both food and fluid. This includes no desserts and no many of these oral nutrition supplements. The osmolality of them is really not appropriate for ileostomy patients. So not prescribing enter, not prescribing boost in a patient who has a high output ileostomy as a way to get in nutrition, because we are potentially only worsening the fact that these, out, these outputs may increase from that. Um, avoiding sugar alcohols in liquid meds and sugar-free diabetic foods. From a salt perspective, increasing salt or salty food intakes, specifically those with end jejunostomies or ileostomies. From a fluid perspective, drinking smaller amounts between meals, so not drinking large amounts at one time and sipping between meals. 
avoiding hypertonic beverages. Many sport drinks, juice and soft drinks are all hypertonic. Um, so we really should be not providing juice to these patients who have high output ileostomies. So you think of what a clear liquid tray is and juice. Um, we order an Ensure with that to give them extra nutrition. So all these things are not recommended in high output ileostomies, as well as limiting the hypotonic fluids. There is something called oral rehydration solutions, which are very specific kind of ratios of sugar to salt and fluid. And this creates an ideal kind of environment, a fluid environment for the patients to better absorb their hydration. Here's a couple of recipes and cheat sheets you can use. The WHO has a nice one too at the bottom there listed. So these are really, we encourage patients to get half of their fluids in from oral rehydrations to help increase their overall hydration status and to maximize their absorption ability um, between the fluids that they're taking in. Here's a nice kind of overview, foods that may cause diarrhea or foods that may help thicken stool. Uh, so we give a nice packet for any of our patients who are new ileostomies to help educate them on some of the foods that they potentially are consuming that may be causing diarrhea and how we can potentially help thicken up their stool using food. So today we did an overview of what malnutrition is, how to diagnose it, intervene with it, troubleshoot it. Uh, we talked a little bit about pancreatitis and using enteral nutrition therapy versus parenteral nutrition. We talked about ileostomy diet overview. And there's my contact information if you have any questions. And I look forward to hearing from you all at the Q&A session.